Hazel, thank you so much for making time to join the show. It's such a pleasure to have you. Um, I think it's always nice to start a podcast interview with a little bit about who you are and what you do and who you help with your area of expertise. So should we dive in there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you for having me. Um, So my name's Hazel. I'm a medical doctor, a nutritionist, um, personal trainer and author and founder of The Food Medic, which is an educational platform aimed at basically bridging the gap between conventional medicine and the latest thoughts and developments in nutrition and lifestyle. Amazing. Multifaceted. Uh, You have such an an impressive list of qualifications and I'm really excited to share with our audience the journey that you've been through as an entrepreneur as well, which I noticed you didn't necessarily list in your job title there, but firm believer that what comes with a list of expertise like yours is also this ability to build a brand build a community and you've done such an amazing job of that can you take us back to the early days of I guess qualifying in your area of expertise because it's a little bit different you had I suppose um, a particular career path as a medical doctor that I'm sure you had planned at that time to pursue but interestingly you were also building your personal brand so let's go way back to the beginning where you started you know your Instagram page and your website and so on and can you share a little bit with us about that time? Yeah for sure so I ha- I've actually had quite a convoluted route into what I do today. Um, So I decided sometime in my teens that I wanted to be a doctor, pretty late actually. Um, I'd lost my dad to a stroke and that was where my interest in medicine came from and also my interest in nutrition and lifestyle. So I ended up studying a degree called medical sciences in Wales. I'm originally from Ireland, so I moved country, studied this degree which was a three year feeder degree into medicine. And during that time, that was when I was really like developing my interest in how our role, how our lifestyle plays a role in our future health and disease. And so I applied for medicine, got into it. I was super excited. And once I started, I realized I wasn't going to learn anything to do with nutrition or lifestyle. Um, Yes, we mentioned it in lectures, but it was mostly pain lip service to these kind of important factors in our life and I think because I'd gone through that experience as a teenager where my parent had died from a condition that was hugely related to our lifestyle um you know cardiovascular disease is very much stems from our nutrition our lifestyle our stress our physical activity levels yes genetics and other factors but I knew that lifestyle played a role And so it felt very unusual to me to go through medicine and not learn about these things. And so in my first year of medicine in 2012, I started the Food Medic Instagram and WordPress website. Um, And I don't really know what my vision for it was then. It was mostly for me to stay accountable to my learning so that I could learn about how we could kind of integrate nutrition and other healthy habits into mainstream medicine with this like vision to be some kind of superhuman doctor that would bring it all together. Um, And so it mostly began began as a passion project or a personal project. And around that time, Instagram was just starting. And so it was very easy to gain traction and interest and followers. And quite quickly, the Daily Mail spotted me and produced this or wrote this article about like how I was this medical student trying to change the future of the NHS um even though I've never said that but it was assumed by what I was doing and by the time I qualified in 2016 I'd been approached by my publishers to write my first book actually they approached me for a two book deal and so I was leaving medical school with a two book deal under my belt and I moved to London and started working in a busy central London hospital and the food medic just continued as this like stream alongside my main role as a doctor. 
and somewhere along the way I you know I you know I trained as a normal doctor I was doing my rotations but after my first two years I decided to go and do my master's in nutrition so I could be dual qualified and I returned to the NHS then and well the whole time I was working there but I returned full-time and I worked as a nutrition doctor for a little while which wasn't really what I wanted to do because nutrition as a doctor is very prescriptive. Um, I really enjoyed what I learned and I loved the team I worked with. And it just further made me understand that where I wanted to be was more in a public health education role. Um, those plans were kind of, I guess, uh, delayed for a little while because I was a COVID doctor then for two years. And that was during that time, obviously, we all spent a lot of time thinking about what our life was going to be and what we really wanted and what was important to us. And after a period of what was diagnosed as essentially burnout from um, my therapist and GP, I had a really hard look at myself and thought, I can't really continue working as a doctor full time in the NHS and a trainee doctor and do what I'm doing as the food medic. And so that was really the straw that broke the camel's back and it made me take the leap out of the NHS and and go all in on the food medic and what I do, which was absolutely terrifying. And I know I shared a lot of this with you um, kind of on a personal level. And now that I'm 12 months out, I feel so much more comfortable. I, I kind of have very much clarity for the first time in a long time my physical and mental health is also incredibly um much more improved as a result of just mm. kind of taking that leap and now I'm kind of I guess all in business owner entrepreneur um and doing what I really love doing and that's helping people it's just in a different capacity yeah such a powerful story and I'm kind of glad that we have almost summarized the whole story but what I do want to do is kind of go back a little bit because I know that there'll be a lot of health professionals listening to this podcast and um, I've had the privilege of working with quite a few medical doctors who have made the decision to leave the public health sector um, be that in the UK or elsewhere and it's such a difficult, almost ethical dilemma in some some ways, isn't it? And I'd love for you to share a little bit about just firstly, the importance of your time in that public health sector or just in practice as a medical professional, whether you're listening and you are a medical doctor or whether you are a health professional or practitioner in some other capacity working in public health, just how important that has been in shaping who you've become today as a an expert in your field yeah I think it's uh, like really instrumental to what I do even if I'm not practicing within uh, the NHS at the moment what I've taken from that and after training within a healthcare system especially a public healthcare system has been incredibly helpful um what I've learned from seeing patients and doing that training process has shaped how I speak and how I educate others now and like I think it's really helpful to gain any sort of experience there whether it's public or private and bring it forward Um, and I think also if I'd taken the leap earlier I probably would have felt like I hadn't got everything I needed I hadn't learned everything I needed and I think it makes me a better um I guess health professional or health practitioner because I have that experience I know what it's like to work the night shifts I know what it's like to work in an overrun um underserved healthcare system and see patients of from all different backgrounds and men and women and really understand what it is that makes me want to do this job and where Mm -hmm. I fit into health and uh, being a healthcare practitioner. So that was really interesting. And I definitely did try to leave or think I had to leave earlier and I stopped myself and that's when I retrained and then went back. And I'm really glad I did. And I'm really 
grateful I also work, worked throughout the pandemic. I think that was probably the most, uh, it was um, an experience I will never forget. And I'm hugely grateful for it as traumatic as it was because I personally and professionally grew in huge amounts during those two years. Um, and yeah, I feel proud that I was able to help out as well. Mm, yeah. And I actually remember if we rewind the clock to that point in time where you decided to go back and do your master's in nutrition, because I remember at the time we were talking about the evolution of the food medic and the opportunities that existed. And, you know, frankly, you had a lot of big opportunities at that time from a business perspective. And yet you actually prioritized that educational piece, which you know, as an expert in the wellness industry is the backbone of your future business, isn't it? You know, you are, your business is only as credible and as, um, you know, practically useful as it, as the information and knowledge and capacity and credibility that you have to share as well. And so, although it probably felt at the time, like you were having to put some of those big opportunities a little on pause, what it has done is actually shaped the offering that you have today in a much more powerful way because you've got those qualifications. And it's always um, it's always a little bit of a balancing act, isn't it? Because I don't know if you find this, but so many of my clients uh, let additional qualifications and the need to keep qualifying get in the way of them actually putting amazing work out into the world. So I'd love to know how you sort of have juggled that balance of, I suppose it's a little bit of imposter syndrome, isn't it? It's like, do I know enough to share this stuff or do I need to be more qualified, have more pieces of paper, have more letters beside my name to be able to do what I want to do? What's your experience been with that? Yeah, I definitely relate to that. And I think it is a balancing act because it's hugely important to have the right credentials for the people that you're serving. But it's also very easy to keep putting off showing up and starting a business because you feel like you need to be an expert in every field. And even when I signed up for my master's, I was thinking, do I need this? Like, am I really, you know, am I doing the right thing here? And I had advice from other people to say like, you know, that no one's asking you to do this master's, but what my gut was telling me is that I really wanted to do it. And I personally love university. Um, I've done <laughs> three degrees, I would do a fourth, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. I think I'm just like, it's the way they teach, I learn in that way. So I enjoy doing it. Um, but I have had to stop myself from doing further um, kind of qualifications even now even now I'm like oh wouldn't it be great to kind of have like add maybe some psychotherapy to what I offer or maybe it would be good to go and do a business degree so then I'd have that and I could learn more there but you have to just kind of think about like what are what is the basic that I need to have that covers me that allows me to do the work and anything else mm -hmm. else is extra but don't let it stop you from just getting started um I think if you're like academically inclined it can also just be a thing to like like almost like a comfort blanket like oh I've, <laughs> I've got all these degrees so you know but as we know like you can have all the degrees in the world it doesn't mean that you're going to be great at what you do or it doesn't mean you're going to have a successful business um it's it's just having what you need and being very good at, you, at what you do because one of the benefits of working practically in the NHS that's given me life experience that's given me actually like real life experience with patients that I can't learn from you know sitting in lectures or doing an extra degree and I think you know one of the evolutions of what I'll do next is working one-to-one -one with clients so I'll gain that experience which I don't have yet.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as you say, there's sort of two journeys going on in tandem, isn't there? There's the build, building of a business and building of a brand and building of, you know, we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but the courses and, and memberships and things, the way that you actually deliver your expertise to the world. And then there's this evolution of your expertise. So, you know, your artistry, your knowledge, you know, adding professional development into the mix and you've you've now got this wonderful balance of both I think but let's talk about that entrepreneurial journey Mm -hmm. because I know how uncomfortable it was for you to actually name yourself as an entrepreneur to step into that what do you think played a role in that and do you think part of it was you know that doctors are doctors and business people are business people and kind of separating those two things in your mind what what kind of played into that identity shift yeah I think I still feel uncomfortable with it I'm getting there but um I think it's because like no one no one that I know anyway gets into medicine for money and I think the fact that doctors are striking at the moment and that illustrates how poorly paid junior doctors are you know 14 pound an hour is just like it's outrageous and people don't really know people didn't know that was the case up until recently and so that just shows like you know people are doctors for different reasons and that is because it's a vocation for a lot of people and it's to help people and Mm. talking about money as a doctor always felt um I don't know like I felt like it wasn't something that I should ethically do and then earning money through alternative routes outside of the NHS always made me feel slightly uncomfortable yet as a doctor working in London it's almost impossible to pay your bills and rent if you're not earning if you're not doing extra work if you're not doing extra hours and so Hmm. I think how I learned to rationalize it is um is really unpack where those thoughts came from and I don't know whether it's just kind of messaging or society that teaches us that like you know doctors and teachers and anyone who works in these um professions have a role to play and then they should do it and they shouldn't ask for money and it's just like it's a duty that we have and I think you know we absolutely do have a duty of care and every doctor and every nurse that I've worked with in the NHS goes over and above to provide that care, but they deserve to be paid for it as well. And then when it Mm -hmm. comes to earning money as an entrepreneur and building a platform and helping people, I was working over and above to produce content and not asking for a penny because I enjoyed doing it. I felt like it provided value and it wasn't until I started to grow my team and I had to pay them that I realized this was an unsustainable business model. And in order to grow and help more people, you have to earn money. And I think it was not viewing money as this thing that was um, like dirty or greedy for wanting it, but actually seeing it as this like value exchange. It was allowing us to grow, it was allowing us to do better and I guess like getting rid of those old ideas I had about money Mm. was a lot of like personal growth I had to go through with and not really caring what other people thought about me being a business owner as well as being a public health serving doctor. Mm, Yeah and I think that's extremely admirable and I think it's extremely inspiring for those listening because it does require you to look at those beliefs and to ask yourself, you know, is that a story that society has told us we should believe or is it something that I personally really do believe and how is that belief influencing my ability to have an even greater impact? And that shift that you just shared of seeing it as um an enabler, right? Seeing money as a vehicle through which you can touch more lives, transform more lives, access a bigger audience. It's not 
you know, it's not by magic that this incredibly high level content that you create makes its way into the world. It takes expertise and, you know, production capacity and Mm. resource. And, you know, um, I'd love for you to shed a little bit of light on what that team looks like behind the scenes, because not that we need to justify it in any way, but it, it sometimes does help for people to see just what it takes to deliver a world class expert knowledge business like this um so can you give us a little bit of background and at what point you decided that you needed to take on those team members yeah for sure i still have no full-time employee um apart from me and so i'm the only one on payroll but i have a team of um i guess experts in their own right so i have more administrative roles that are filled i've got like jemima who helps me with the website and social media and newsletter and manages our member zone um i have two vas i've got one webinar va and so she's shan she runs all of our webinars with me and then i've got holly who runs um kind of admin for the website admin with my inbox and also personal admin also Um, and she's helping me with the course. And then I also have um, Luce who helps with photography with recipe development as well. I've got Mike who, and Rebecca, and they help with photography and videography. So they help with all the reels that you see and things like that. Um, And then we have all our writers. And so we've got a team of experts and dietitians and Maeve, and we've got a GP, Nerja, and we've got Adam, who's our personal trainer, and we've got Yasmin, who's our physiotherapist. And so between us all, we all chip in in various ways. And one thing I learned um, actually quite recently is that you can't be expert in everything and it's better to outsource to people who are very good at a small amount of things Whereas Mm. one of the issues that I was running into is I was trying to do everything myself. And to be honest, I still probably do a lot of things that I'm not the best person to do. Um, I still create a lot of the, I still develop most of the recipes for the website and shoot them and do a lot of um, video editing and things, which takes me a lot longer than it takes other people. But because I enjoy it and I've been doing it for so long, letting go of the reins has been tricky. Um, I still write (laughs) the newsletters. I still like write everything for like the webinars and podcasts and everything like that. So, yeah. And I guess an extension to that, that's my core team. But, you know, the podcast also has its own team and that's um, with Global. So I don't produce any of that. You know, they're they make it sound as good as it is. Whereas when I first started it, it used to just be me renting like a little phone box basically and, you know, speaking into (laughs) a mic and trying to get guests to sign up. Whereas now we're on season, season 10 will be our next season and we've had seven plus million downloads and these things take time. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, in the beginning it was just me and slowly over time there was three of us and now there's maybe 10 of us. And I'm really proud to be a part of a team and not just me. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And you're right. You really have to, to lean into two, two things that come out of that for me. One is that there, there is a moment in time where you realize you can't do everything and that you need help. But also it's really smart to not just suddenly hand everything over to a team because yeah. it's still important for you to understand what's happening and it's still important for you to understand how things work and it's still important that you have you know, a finger in some of those pies to keep you in touch with what's going on in your business and to not grow too quickly in terms of that outsourcing. So it's an, like you say, it's, it's, it's starting out with baby steps and getting used to the idea that you can hand things over and feeling um, confident that you're handing them over to someone who you can fully trust with it. And we all go through that evolution, I think, of becoming, um, you know, a CEO, someone who oversees the vision and doesn't necessarily do everything, but it's a work in progress for everyone. And I think it's nice for our listeners to hear that it's you know an ongoing project for you as well yeah for sure. um 
I'd love to, I'd love to talk a little bit about, you know, um, some of the ways that you are now developing your business model, because we've talked about how important it is to sustain that business model so that you can not only have a team supporting you, but so that you can reach more people. So tell me a little bit more about how I know a little bit of this, but tell our audience, Mm -hmm. I suppose, a little bit more about how the food medic brand is evolving in terms of how you're able to deliver your knowledge in, in those kind of value packed offers, I suppose. Yeah. So, I mean, for a very long time, it was just Instagram was our main platform and the website of providing information. And the website is, was like always a very much traditional blog, which I think like no one really does anymore. Um, but I really feel passionate about holding on to it because um, obviously in captions and social media and with people's attention span on those platforms, there's only a limited amount of information you can share. Whereas I think having longer form content on websites is hugely important for the work that we do because it allows people to like go a bit deeper and fully understand things. So we can take deep dives into health topics or, you know, share information around nutrition and certain health conditions and things like that. So um, I see Instagram as almost like, the business card and um like the catalog of what we offer and then the website being the kind of the full experience and so i still produce a lot of content on instagram all of which is free and um as part of that and how we've grown in terms of like uh, becoming a business i've worked with a lot of brands on producing content so brand partnerships And for a very long time, that was the only revenue stream. So that's how I paid the rest of the team was the partnerships that we do. But, um, and of course, we're always working with partners that we know and love and really trust. And that's something that goes through a really vetted process with me and my manager, Nora. And we make sure that it's someone that we are very proud to put our name against. But because they're quite infrequent and they can come and go and also I don't know how long social media will be here or whether it will change or whether Instagram will close one day. For me, it doesn't feel like a very secure um, or strong anchor for my business. And Mm -hmm. I hope it stays. (laughs) I would really love for it to stay because that's where my community is. But I also want to become more self-sufficient in the business and I want us to be able to support ourselves. And so since leaving the NHS, I have thought about different ways of doing that. And um, one of the ways that we've managed to become more self-sufficient and ensure that we can keep the the website running and the recipes going, the podcast going and everything is developing a, a membership option for our website. And while everything on social media and some of our website content remains free for a small fee, we allow people to access all of our recipes, a strength training program, um, all of our expert articles, um, all within one hub, essentially. And then for a higher price per month, you can get that plus all of our webinars. Um, We still host webinars monthly, which people can kind of pay per view. And they're a similar kind of expert led model. So it's a two hour webinar and all of them are CPD endorsed, which is really important for me because as a health professional, I know how hard it can be to kind of get those hours in and get those points for your portfolio um, in topics that you're interested in. So this was a way of us (laughs) making it accessible for both health professionals and non-health professionals. So our webinars, our membership, And then um, in the future, I will be bringing out my course Align, which is um, a 10 week course teaching women how to live in alignment with their menstrual cycle. Um, And I guess that's sort of an extension of my final book, not my final book, hopefully, but my last book, The Female Factor, um, because I had so much feedback from the back of that, which was like, I love this. I want to know more. And so this is the kind of an opportunity to go deeper and work in a group setting with women 
and then hopefully well not hopefully but in the future I'm planning to go even deeper and work with a select number of women kind of on a one-to-one basis and I've decided to just keep that women and work with them on nutrition and lifestyle related to female health problems. Mm. So two things that I would love to dive into with you on this. One is that decision to start to produce a more specialized body of expert work, um, which, you know, when I talk to my clients about being able to grow an audience in an increasingly noisy wellness industry, having a specialist area of expertise that you become known and trusted for is a really powerful way of standing out. Yeah. So strategically it's important, but also when you are um, a health professional or a well-being expert, it's, it's useful to be able to channel your energy and your ambition and your passion into a specific area. So can you talk to me a little bit about how important it is that you're starting to specialize and to focus your expertise more on that area of women's health and menstrual cycles and so on? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, the food medic is largely founded on nutrition and the integration between that and our health and medicine. And that's, always been my kind of core passion and the reason I got into this the reason I wrote the book the female factor is because I realized that women were not receiving the same treatment in health and healthcare, and that most of the research we have today is based on a male body and I found that like as a doctor to many women and as a woman myself pretty outrageous and I think writing that book made me realize that this is a very much underserved and undermet group of people. And I'm not a gynecologist or obstetrician. I've not trained in women's health bar my medical degree, but this was something that I felt really passionate about and felt very much like it felt very innate for me to do. I felt very comfortable doing it and Um, The more I was talking about it and learning about it, the more empowered I felt as a woman myself. And this is something that I wanted everyone to experience. And so, you know, the book was really successful, but I also wanted to do more there because it started a conversation, but practically speaking, I know what it's like as a woman to have issues with your menstrual cycle and how much struggle and trauma that can cause someone and I think there's like this narrative that women that it's normal for women to struggle through their cycles and it's normal to be in pain or it's normal to take holiday leave on your period and none of that is normal and so Mm. you know I didn't I didn't think I was the best person for it I guess but I ended up becoming this became my role and I'm in this role now and I'm hugely passionate about it and I've now brought my nutrition practice into it and I'm bringing my knowledge as a doctor into it and that's what I want my practice to be and you know of course men's health is hugely important as well but this is an area that I thoroughly enjoy working in and I can see the benefit of when you take a woman from A to B to C and help her address those problems and how hugely beneficial that is for her. So I think it's really beneficial for the health professional in question to find out what they're really passionate about. And Mm. if that's coming from a place of personal experience, I think that's even more beneficial for them and for their patient because they can share that experience. But it's also really important for the clients that you work with or the patients that you work with to know that you have this niche and that is where your focus is and you're not trying to cover everything and you're not kind of spinning multiple plates. And so, you know, I'm hugely interested in loads of topics, but I think it's it's really important to kind of plant your feet in, in one thing and become expert in that space. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, like you say, if, if for somebody listening, you're still unsure about, you know, what that area of specialism is going to be for you. The fact that when you were talking about it there, there was one specific thing that you said, and that was 
you know, I, I knew that I wasn't necessarily the best person to talk about it, but I knew that I was passionate about it. And although I know that's a, a, a smidge of kind of humility on your part, Hazel, because you are qualified and credible, it's acknowledging that there will always be someone who knows more than you about something, whatever it is that you teach, right? Whatever field of expertise you're in, there'll always be someone who knows more. And I guess why I love that honesty is that we all have a voice in our head that says, maybe I shouldn't do this because someone else has more knowledge than me and they should be the person who does this. And yet, you know, if you were a restaurant owner, you wouldn't think, well, there are lots of other restaurants for people to go to, so I shouldn't open my restaurant because if you like food, you know, you're going to go to lots of different restaurants. And the same is true of, you know, health and well-being advice. Um, there will be other experts that your audience will go to for information as yeah. well. But instead of asking yourself, who am I to share this information and to be this expert, I think it's so powerful to flip that script and say, who am I not to do this work? Especially if you're so driven and passionate about it that, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years time, you don't want to be asking yourself, you know, why didn't I, why didn't I do that thing that I felt so called to do? Why didn't I follow my passion? And that I think is, um, is what quietens that voice of self-doubt. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think for a long time I struggled with, you know, where am I going to be when I'm 60 years of age or like where do I want to be like where where do I want to be and I couldn't really see myself um you know I studied in Wales a lot of my friends are now GPs living in the Welsh valleys and incredibly happy but I couldn't see myself there and I couldn't see myself as a high-end consultant in in nutrition which is what I was going to do in gastroenterology I was heading there and you know, it would probably require me to do another PhD, to do a PhD and do further learning and give up the food medic. And I couldn't see myself being happy knowing that I'd given that up. And now, and I, if you said, well, Hazel, you know, you're going to work in with women specifically and you're going to ha- help them with their women's health problems and you're going to advise them in nutrition and living across their cycle. I never would have said that would be me, but when I picture it now and I see myself doing that in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years, I'm like, that makes me feel like I'm in the right place. And I could Mm. imagine doing that and feeling like I'm getting a lot of job satisfaction from it, feeling like I'm helping people. And also that I'm progressing because this is a very, um, very much an evolving field of science. And I want to be on the forefront of that and learn with it and share that knowledge. So it's super exciting for me. And I'm hoping that, you know, that will, that I'll be part of that, that kind of drive and that mission to better women's health in the future. Yeah. Amazing. So I suppose the last thing that I want to talk about is the business side of things, because you've made these decisions. Now you want to share this knowledge and expertise with the world. And so you've entered this, uh, this world of webinars and Mm -hmm. online courses. And now there's this whole new skill set that you've really had to learn. And it's been wonderful to watch that journey, um, from the sidelines for me as a business coach. But, um, what I so admire about you is this willingness to to continue, continually learn and to add mm-hmm. a new skill set. So tell me a little bit about that. You know, has it been daunting? Has it been overwhelming? And how is your relationship with these new business concepts um, been for you? And, and, you know, how has it empowered you to be able to push this mission further out into the world? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a humbling 12 months, really. I think, um, my boyfriend always laughs because I obviously had this business for the last few years. And although we were selling things, maybe like I had journals and things like that, I've never really learned how to sell. I've never tried to sell. I just tell people this is available. You can buy it if you want. But I've always just kind of let it just happen. And I didn't have huge goals for it. I didn't really have any structure around it. I've never, I never heard of a funnel before, email sequences or nurture sequences or 
landing pages like this was not in my vocabulary up until about the last eight months and so now that I'm learning all of that a I feel like I know nothing because I'm on that kind of curve of like wow there's so much to learn but also it's been great to kind of build structure around what I'm doing and see oh when you really do put your mind to it you can make your life easier in the long run and you can grow your business in a lot more of a constructive way as opposed to just um I guess how I was working originally was just constantly having to promote constantly launching new things and getting exhausted and burnt out by kind of using those methods all the time of coming up with new ways thinking I had to always reinvent the wheel when really like what I've been learning what I've been learning from working with you and Hannah is you know you build out these templates you get really good at building funnels and email sequences and they become a lot easier than moving forward and you create a business model that can work for you and you're not just constantly you're not just the person who's you know bringing in new customers all the time and kind of hoping that month on month he will make enough to keep the business going so it has been it's you know it's been overwhelming but also really exciting like I'm I've been really enjoying learning all these things and I think surrounding myself with other people who are in a similar situation and having conversations with other business owners, um, you you realize that everyone's kind of doing the same thing. Everyone's in the same boat and um, there are people out there who will help you. And Mm -hmm. there are people out there who are very good at their job. You just have to ask. Yeah, for sure. Um, And I think what you said there about it ultimately making your life easier and that impact piece, right, that you can actually create structures that enable more people to access your expertise becomes the driving force to overcome that fear or discomfort around learning new things. It's like, okay, well, this is going to be difficult for a while with anything new, but ultimately it's going to, it's going to enhance my mission. It's going to enable that access to increase. It's going to, you know, multiply that impact in the long run. Um, so, you know, it's very, it's very inspiring to be watching you learning that and to be implementing it and to see the results from it because that reinforces, okay, this is all worth it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. And I think, you know, there's still so much that I have to learn or like stuff that I've learned, learned that I've not implemented yet. And I think some of that overwhelm came from, oh my God, I need to have all of this done before I launch this business or this course or whatever. But what I've learned, especially even, you know, with the membership where I kind of launched it and then I'm kind of going back and doing a lot of the stuff I probably should have done beforehand is it's okay <laughs> to start and learn as you yeah. go along. Like that's fine. Um, and that would be kind of like something, a really big learning that I've had over the last couple of months. Like, if you, especially if you've got like a perfectionist mentality, you think you have to like have nailed everything and, you know, have the smoothest running business or email sequence or funnels or whatever, but you don't like just get started. If you've got something to share, then share it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the beautiful thing about a service-based business and particularly an online service-based business, right? Is that you can reiterate things, you can improve them. And I always say, you know, even to myself, done is better than perfect because it's much more powerful to put that work out into the world, to be able to get feedback and then to be able to improve it over time and evolve it over time than it is to wait and then miss that opportunity. Um, because you're waiting for it to be perfect. So for someone starting out, Hazel, it's easy to look at somebody like you and see all the things you're doing, right? That you're publishing all of this incredible content, that you are running these incredible webinars with, you know, expert guests, that you have a membership, that you're about to launch an online course. And what I never want this podcast to be is, um, you know, a, a, a source of overwhelm for those yeah. listening to be thinking, oh, okay, well, to be successful, I have to be doing all the things that Hazel is doing. So what I would love is to get your take on for someone, you know, early on in building an expert business as a wellness expert, you know, where would you suggest putting your time and focus? 
in 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 kind of building i think um i really think that one of the biggest uh reasons the food medic has been successful or that i've been successful is the community that i built um and i'm very lucky in that you know, when I when it came to leaving the NHS, I was stepping into a brand and a business that I'd been nurturing for 10 years. So it wasn't this huge day one start for me. I just went from someone who's working part time in it to full time in it. And I think building a community is something that you can start doing early doors, but they're going to be your supporters throughout everything. Um, if you're just starting out, it can feel overwhelming because where most people will find their communities now will be social media and it can feel hard to build an audience, but you don't need to have 500,000 followers. You just need to have a core community of people who are listening and willing to engage. And, you know, I see bigger accounts and bigger businesses than mine who can't sell anything because they've got no connection with their audience. You know, they're not showing up daily. They're not producing free content. They're not listening to their audience. Whereas, mm. you know, I'm always checking in, you know, what do you guys want more of, whether it's recipes, whether it's webinars, whether it's like, you know, podcast guests, really listening what people want more of instead of just kind of trying to think I know what people want. So building community is hugely important. I would say like that has been instrumental for my business. And I think after that, I would say start with one thing. I have lots of things I want to implement and I've kind of sort of been building them slowly together, but I'm launching things one by one because it's hugely overwhelming also from kind of an outsourcing and financial point of view, you don't want to put everything into one or into multiple things. And so I think it's really beneficial to just focus on one thing at a time. And um, because you've got time, you've got loads of time. And I mean, you are better, um, you're more of an expert to say whether you start with like one-to-one -one or group, but my feeling was I was starting with the thing that felt most natural and most achievable to me in that moment. And that was our food medic membership. And I knew that was going mm -hmm. to help the most amount of people in a short amount of time. So that's what I started with. And now that we're up and running and building on the course, and once we're up on that, I will work on the one-to-one. -one. Um, so I think, yeah, community and starting with one thing at a time is my biggest piece of advice to avoid the overwhelm. Yeah. And I would echo that 100%. I think um, I love the point that you made that you don't need, you know, half a million followers mm -hmm. or even a hundred thousand followers to have a successful business. You do need to be connected. And there's that, you know, um, that concept of having a thousand raving fans is more powerful than, you know, having half a million people who aren't connected or don't understand what you do or don't get value from you. So you're right. Nurturing a smaller group of people can be just as powerful in terms of translating that into a successful business. And I think where you're a little bit of an anomaly in terms of the order of things is that frankly, Hazel, I think you already put in the work in doing the one-to-one -one stuff in terms of mm. building connection and understanding and empathy with your audience because you are a practicing doctor for all of those years. You were out in the field learning to engage with individuals and that's why it translates so nicely into your membership proposition, but also that you had spent 10 years, as you say, building an audience. So for most experts, it's so valuable to start with that one-to-one -one proposition because it gives you that ability to create mastery in your area of expertise. Yeah. I think you did it in a slightly different way because it may not have been in the capacity of being a, a business owner, but it... I'm sure you would agree was the basis upon which creating a membership was easy for you because you really knew what people wanted and you had you you had become an expert in your field um and you also had an audience with whom you could launch that membership yeah. option. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree and I think um from speaking to mostly like nutritionists um, and dietitians who were going pr 
private and setting up their own companies, it can feel really daunting because, you know, when you are setting up one to one um, based business, business models, you are kind of working by yourself. And so it can feel like difficult to bounce ideas off people. But one of the things I found hugely instrumental is speaking to colleagues who are already set up and just asking them, you know, about their experience. And most of them have just been like, Hazel, just got to get started, even if you just have one client, because that's that's where you're going to do your learning. And I think mm-hmm. that's a, a really great mentality to have. Yeah, for sure. Again, done is better than perfect, Mm -hmm. right? Getting It's all about getting started. Um, Hazel, I've loved this conversation. I love doing a little bit of a quick fire round at the end. So let's do quick five questions. First thing that comes to your mind um, when it comes to these questions. So the first thing is, what would you say is one thing you wish you'd known when you started your business journey? Oh, I wish I wasn't learning all about um, kind of email marketing and funnels after I've I'd launched things because I think it would have made my life a lot easier in the beginning. Um, like I said, I definitely almost, you know, burnt out with different launches because I was constantly trying to come up with new and inventive ways to um, sell things or like get people to sign up for things. Whereas um, I've realized now that I can make the process so much easier. Mm, I love that. And I do hear that a lot, actually. I think maybe there's an assumption because a lot of experts in wellness are very ambitious, you know, very um, capable, very intelligent human beings. And there's this expectation that like, I should know how to do this business stuff. And actually it's a completely, it's like learning a new language, isn't it? It's learning a whole new skill set. And once you give yourself permission to do that, you open up this whole array of tools that are going to help you to make your life easier. So that's such great advice. Um, What's one thing that maybe you wish you had done sooner in your business? Um, Probably outsourcing a lot of things um, with, I think I initially I was trying to find, you know, one person that would help me with everything. And Mm -hmm. I realized that actually that really exists <laughs> and if you do find that person they're probably not going to be very very good at everything so right. now I've got you know a bigger team but people are working on smaller things and everyone's happier because everyone's doing what they're good at and it just means that we're you know running a lot more smoothly beautiful such good advice um why do you do what you do um I think I, I've i always been a helper and wanting to help people. And I get a lot of satisfaction and gratification from the feedback I get with the people that I work with. And whilst it might seem a bit odd saying that because a lot of the time it's me speaking to an audience of half a million people, a lot of which, you know, I'm not seeing the responses, but it will be like the one message of someone saying, hey Hazel I listened to this podcast and it initiated a conversation with my doctor and I'm getting the help that I need or I've you know read this article on your website and I've integrated this dietary change and it's helped me hugely and it's that that I see like you know it what we do helps people and that's why I do what I do yeah and I can see the smile on your Mm -hmm. face reflects that (laughs) what would you say is the best part about your job um I think the the fact that no day is the same and the creative element of it, you know, I I am a scientist and I think very logically, but I'm also creative and there's no space for creativity in science-based disciplines. <laughs> but in social media or being a creative, I can blend both of them and it like really satisfies, um, I don't know, like my my interests and allows me to get like a lot of value and purpose from the work that I do. So yeah, yeah, I love, I I love, I guess that's my, my, my favorite thing of the job. Yeah. And how beautiful that you get to say, well, I'm both, I'm both a scientist and a creative Mm -hmm. because so often we feel like we need to be pigeonholed into one and one or the other. And you found this incredible career and business that enables you to be both. What, uh, as a final question for you, what would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever received? 
Um, I think from a lot of other business professionals to just start, um, I definitely procrastinate when it comes to starting things because of fear of failure and perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And I know I emailed you about this with regards to my course, because I found, you know, I was constantly holding off, even though it was, you know, the content was there. And I think that simple phrase, just start, you know, just get started, just build out your, your plan, just map it out, just get it on paper. It doesn't mean that, you know, you need to start your business in the morning, but just map out what you want to do. And I think once you start putting it down on paper, it's like less overwhelming and it becomes more possible, more tangible. Yeah, there's just generally great advice. I think that, you know, when something feels big and overwhelming, as soon as you can break it down into little bite sized steps, you can get out of your own way and you can stop worrying about, you know, what step 25 is going to look like yeah. and just focus on step one. Um, and you're such a such a great example of that, just putting one foot in front of the other and seeing where things evolve. Um, thank you so much, Hazel. It's such uh, a gift to be able to share your journey with our audience. Um, you're such an inspiration. And I think there's just so much wisdom in your journey that our audience are, are going to absolutely love. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much.